Uh, we are moving on to uh, our next, uh, next uh, theme, how to implement the green shift in fisheries. And we are going to investigate the market for green transition energies. And to do that is uh, Svein Thompson. Give him a big round of applause. <clears throat> Svein has founded Stakeholder. He is an economist and uh, has been working in the uh, Norwegian Processing Industry Association and as an editor and reporter in the uh, very famous Norwegian newspaper Dagens Næringsliv. And now you are here to talk about uh, green transition energies, but you also have a little story of why you ended up uh, now here talking about the ocean and fisheries. So yeah, that's right. Uh, my grandfather was a fisher. <laughs> he. Um, he lived on a very small island just outside Mandal, the southernmost tip of Norway. At that time, there were 20 families, there were schools, and everyone lived off fishery and small farming. So, after having worked with climate change issues and politics, I was very happy when I was asked if I could go and look into the, the, the fishing fleet because I sort of felt I belong there, <laughs> in a way. Even though I must say, I know nothing about biology. And, um, no, I know that I know even less than I did before. <laughs> but you know something about green energy, and that's what you're gonna give the audience. The floor I will. is yours. Thank you. I'll go straight to the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, as some of you might know, we were at the level of emissions of about 1 million tons CO2 equivalent around year 2000. And then it's, we managed to get them down, these emissions, probably because of a relative high fish richness compared to the quotas. Um, there was also a so-called structuring in the fleet. We had a lot of um, large uh, cod trawlers, and we ended up with, with less. I think that might, ex these two things probably explain why we were able to nearly half the, the emissions, but then for some reasons, probably biological reasons and other reasons, we are now at a level of about 900 million tons, uh, no, thousand tons, which is a considerable amount, about 2% of the of the combined Norwegian emissions. So obviously we have to do something about this. Um, there are thousands of ways we could reduce emission, but it all comes down to reducing use of energy. From operations, the way we organize, the way we regulate the, the fleet, and of course, how we design the vessels. Uh, and then third option is, you know, fine, clean, green energy. There are lots of limitations though. It's not like decarbonizing a bus line here in Trondheim, which is fairly straightforward. Uh, we have about 4,000 vessels. Most of them are small and they stay in business for very long time, 60 years. You can find some that have been there for 90 years. So there is no quick fix. We have to find solutions that fit today's vessels, fit the infrastructure, and must have relatively high energy density with comparably low costs. And they should be, there should be a high degree of sustainability and it must be safe. Lots of uh, these, or at least a couple of these uh, potential fuels are dangerous. Uh, I've tried to organize this around two parameters, the energy density at our horizontal axis and the estimated production cost in 2030. It's the production cost, not the market price. And as you see, 
I, what, what we would like is to have a lot of options down in the right corner to get with the MGO. But we don't. We have renewable diesel, HVO, as we say in Norway, uh, as the one closest to the MGO. We have gas solutions, LNGs. There are not many whistles. You'll meet one of the uh, owners of a whistle later on. If you have LNG, you can switch to biological methane as well. And you get some way along by using LNG, about 25% reduction compared to MGOs. But altogether, I think what we see as the perhaps only big solution is drop in biofuels. There is a functioning market. It's more expensive than MGO. It's been very volatile. It's politically driven. Um, you know, last year, Sweden decided to cut the blending mandate from 30.5% to 6% in 2024, which meant billions of liters went out of the, the, the demand. Um, this curve goes only to August last year, but during 2024, the price has nearly, uh, nearly halved. Liquid biogas is easy to pro produce, but a very, a very small quotas uh, available. Electricity, at least for large uh, vessels up to now, is best for peak shaving and optimizing the operations, the motor and so on. And it could be important while at Kai. What is coming on now? Uh, I think this is, this is what makes me optimistic. There are coming new technology pathways where we use other biomasses than fat and oils. Fat and oils is today used uh, in making hobo, hefa, fame. Um, it's the easy way. It's much more difficult to make biofuel from wood chips but it's possible, and it's being commercialized as we sit here. And there are different kinds of technologies. Uh, the one um, chosen by Stadtkraft at uh, Tuft outside Oslo is the hydrothermal conversion. I've seen it actually. <laughs> you know, they, they take the wood chips suck it up in uh, steel tubes, put it under pressure, and they heat it up. And after 20 minutes, oil seeps out in the other end. It's a little mir miracle. Okay, I'm not a chemist. I'll go, go on. Uh, the thing is, there is a massive potential if we use um, uh, the discards from agriculture, forestry, uh, waste of all kinds. We could easily 10 times or even increase 25 times the current production in Europe. And this is, this is all sustainable advanced bio, biofuels. Um, this is the latest pro, um, pro, uh, projection. <laughs> that I've seen. Uh, it's from Argus, a uh, very famous uh, an analytic uh, environment in, in the United States. It was published last week by Norwegian Environmental Agency. And what is interesting here is that part A, residues from forestry gardening and so on, is taking a larger and larger part of the over overall production. This happened already, but it's going to more or less uh, explode in the com coming years. And it's absolutely necessary. Thinking of um, the sustainable air fuel, we have re regulations in the EU saying that in 2030, the blending 
uh, must be 6%, and then it's gradually in, in increasing. And that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of biofuels. So there's absolutely hope. Price forecast, a bit gloomy. Uh, as I said, we are on a, on a low level right now uh, due to Chinese HVO um, and the Sweden cut. New regulations will increase demand for Part A HVO, the most, uh, the, the new technology HVO. Um, but gradually, more plants will increase the, the, uh, the production capacity and we will see prices go come, come down. We don't know how low they will be, but there will be something like this. Uh, this is the main problem for Norwegian fishers today. We have a um, twofold climate politics to, towards the fishing fleet, the CO2 tax, which is going to, to rise the price of, um, of fuel from with, with about seven krona in 2030. And we have the blending mandate, which came into force last year with a blending of 6%. It will rise to 18% in 2030. But as you can see from the chart, it's a CO2 tax that is really burdensome. As, a, as an economist, I would embrace CO2 taxes usually, but not in this industry currently, because there is a real risk of carbon leakage. Those who can will bunker outside Norway, of course. And it's even possible to bunker in Norway, but avoid the taxes by saying that we are a vessel in international traffic going to Iceland and start fishing from Iceland. It's, it's really... So we will end up with more steaming, less consumption of biofuels, allows increased CO2 emissions. This is a friend of mine, Cornelius Seifert. He is the one fisher left on Hilde, this island I talked about. His grandfather used to fish with my grandfather. Uh, he has two main incomes. It's mackerel in the summer, and it's cod in the winter. And when we spoke, he was, oh, he was really worried that this season might be his last season for two reasons, the costs and the uh, cuts in the, in the, in the quotas. And it doesn't take much brains to see the solution. Just remove the CO2 tax for fisheries. But keep the blending mandate, because the, man, the, the blending mandate has an immediate effect on climate change emissions. And it will give a signal that fuel will be more expensive in the future and thereby stimulating energy savings. And I also think it's a good idea to, to keep the CO2 compensation scheme. It maintains the incentive to fish. And fish is life, as you say in stakeholders. Fisca liva. It's the protein with the lowest footprint. So it would be stupid if we cut down on fish production and eat more meat. Thank you. <laughs>